could let me know if you have any issues with that. So thank you for the introduction, Brent. And thank you so much for, for actually providing opportunity to do this event. Um, oh, this is fantastic. Um, so, and I really enjoyed hearing about Chesapeake's journey um, all the way up to, to onboarding Power BI as well. Um, okay, so I just wanna, so the topic here today is, so this is about me, this is what Brenda's already said, so I won't go over that again. Um, but the first topic I wanted to talk about was Power BI architecture. Um, and I talked about this a little bit last time I spoke, I think it more to architect for infrastructure. But I was thinking about it, um, and what I mean by the Power BI architecture is kind of um, designing it so that it's easily managed and maintained, and also knowing what to change the least amount of effort. Um, and that applies to multiple level, levels in Power BI. Um, so the first one, of course, is the centralized data model. Um, so this is one thing I'm a big proponent of. Um, sometimes you'll see when people start using Power BI, they'll have different a data model, and then I'll build another data model for basically the same thing. And so if they can consolidate it as much as possible, kind of have that single source of truth. Um, that doesn't mean you generally ever have one data model. There are always going to be cases for a different data model. But if you're using the same data, um, it's important to try and get that in a single place and reuse it is really the key here. Um, so if you're using, you know, um, you know, expense data or, or um, you know, tracking user traffic or something like that. You don't want to keep pulling it from the source system um, if you already have it in a in a Power BI data model with it's hooked up to a date table. It's all got the measures in that you want. It's got the you know seven day rolling. It's got the year to date. All of that's already done. You don't want to redo that work. Is really where I'm going at. And so as a BIE. Um, a lot of times I'll come and I'll build these centralized data models and I'll build some standardized reporting that um, this build of these data models to kind of show you what's there um, and get people, get people started on it. And then you can kind of have the self-service portion. I talked about that last time. Um, the other side of that is even in the data model, um, there is kind of an architecture there. So if you have like a dev environment and a prod environment, or if you're even migrating, um, from say an on-prem to an Azure environment, if you have the same structure, especially in the data warehouse, it's really cool so you can use the same data model and just change the data source. Um, so you can have one kind of template data model almost at that point, and then you can just flip them out when you're ready. Um, so this is really cool. Um, and then you can actually publish that same data model in multiple locations, multiple apps. You can have an app for dev, you can have an app for prod. Um, and so you can change a data source, publish up to prod, and then you can keep making modifications to it and put it up in dev. And then once you get to the, to the, to the place where you want it, you can push that up to prod as well. And it's really great because then the reports that are in production and dev, you can also do the same thing and connect them up to the different data models um, without having any breaks. So you can have the same report and then connect it up to your dev data model that's published and see what the new measures you've created, if they're going to impact or have a negative impact on their published report or not. So it's a really good way to kind of, you know, sort of changes. And I know in the um, application summit, they talked about putting kind of that data model building into kind of DevOps into a pipeline so you can have uh, more collaborative work in that space as well, which is really awesome because right now it's quite difficult if there's more than one person working on it because you cannot work it on it together. You, one person has to work and then the other person has to say, oh, hey, I'm done with my changes. I've saved it. You go ahead and make changes now. And you have to be very careful. And it's very easy for people to kind of collide if there's not one person kind of managing the process. Okay, um, the other side of it, and this is where I'm gonna kind of deep dive is in the measure. So in the DAX expressions within the data model, you can do some pretty cool um, things here. And this answers some of the more, I, I wanna say probably complex questions that come up a lot, that I've done a lot, is like the multiple date calendars, um, net versus gross data, um, hiding or showing some measures, um, those same things. So like one, one of the classic examples, the first time I did it was with a created by and modified data document. So they wanted to see number of documents created in a document library. And they also want to see 
when they were modified. And so if you connect them up to the same date table, you can actually see both lines on the same chart, with, which is kind of cool. Um, so this is what I'm going to go into now is, is this measure architecture. So what this looks like for the user. So this is what I call like the toggles. So you'll have one chart. And then you can toggle it between net or growth. And it can be a table. It doesn't have to be like a line chart. And you can toggle it between the different, um, the different dates. And I'm going to try and show you this up here in Power BI. So it's a little bit hard to see because I just kind of, you know, see here, I'm, flat, I'm flipping it from net and gross. The numbers are changing slightly. And I have a date offset, which is kind of harder to see. Um, but you'll see this is the 10th. I flip this, it can go to the 11th. So it doesn't, so it's very conscious of what it's doing here. And you can change the product. You can do whatever you want. And these will still work. Now, I built this model last time for this, for the March call. So I just built in this toggle on top of the model. And everything that was already in there is now able to be used with this. And I'll show you how I did that. Let's see if I can do this. So here's like the net or gross example. So in the data table here, we have a year and period, and we have a column for net and a column for growth. Um, <clears throat> now we could, there is a number of approaches to do this. You could reshape the data, you could structure it so they're just a revenue, and then there's a column for net or gross. Sometimes you want to keep them separate just to make sure people don't add it all together. Um, so in this scenario, and I've done it a number of ways, but this is the scenario that I did for the, for the example I just showed you. Um, so I just made a measure that sums up each of the columns, so very simple. And then I created a table, just entered the data, and I put in net or gross. That's it, that's just that toggle that we saw on top of the chart. And now this one, the sum of revenue, is now going to see a switch statement that takes a selected value from whatever is selected on this toggle. If it's net, it'll show you the net revenue. And if it's anything else, it's going to show growth. So at this point, you could also change it. So it looks for growth, and then it'll show growth, and then blank if nothing is selected. But for this one, um, I wanted to just make it so that if nobody, if they didn't find this, say they connected through Excel, or they're making their own report off this data model, and they just use the sum of revenue, it would default to growth. And it just wouldn't duplicate. Now, to add on to this, I'm now including the scenario for the multiple dates. Um, so here in the gray is just what we already did. Now, I have that year period, which is already connected to the date table. Now I added another one, which is offset, it's just taking one month back. Now, I'm connecting that to the date table. And you'll notice it's the dotted line, so it's the inactive relationship. So we have the two relationships established, but by default, it's always going to use this year period. Now I added another one of those, just enter data, enter data table with the date and date offset. And this could be like, you know, your service versus accounting, whatever date um, or the created by modified. And now at the same structure here, except we're just using that relationship if it's date offset is selected. And if not selected, then the date one is gonna be used. And so that's what this does here. And I changed this sum of revenue to sum of revenue base. And then I change now sum of revenue, which is what a lot of other measures in my model are already referencing, to use the date table. So now we can use both of these together. And they'll work with any measures that are dependent on the sum of revenue. Um, so that's kind of how that is done. There are other ways to do it, but the, I like the selected value is probably the easiest one, I think, to explain. Um, other things here, if um, like this has a lot of dependencies, like you, so this one's referencing different measures and it goes kind of down. If you're actually using tabular editor, um, there is a way to see those dependencies, which is kind of cool as well. That's really neat, Zoe. Um, I you. like how you're, it looks like on the left side, you're using uh, an active relationship, that's that solid line, and then mm -hmm. you have an inactive relationship. Let me ask, are you able, um, can you use the use relationship formula even if you don't have an inactive relationship defined? No, you cannot. There are ways to do it with treat as, 
Um, so treat as is a way to kind of do it without the inactive relationship defined, but for use relationship, you absolutely need that, that inactive relationship. Okay. Thanks. Um, and I, I may, I just wanted to mention, I might be the only one hearing it, but it sounds about, only about oh, halfway through your audio got a little bit choppy. I oh, wondered wow. if, um, that's okay. Well, maybe that. if you have a chance, can you maybe, if you left the audio and rejoined, it might, might help it out. Um, if you if you're able to do that, I know it's kind of tricky in Zoom. You might have to go up to the top where you're sharing, and kind of like uh, maybe oh yeah, down in the lower left hand side there's a join audio, uh, and so you maybe you could disconnect and rejoin. But if you know if that doesn't resolve it, we can still hear and understand you, so you can uh, come back and keep going. Um, but yeah, I thought this would be a good. I thought I'd jump in just for a second while you did that uh, because this is a really informative slide for people to start uh, thinking about how how the how the DAX models work mm -hmm. um, and so this is a very this is a professional approach to it right like you define two measures that we can use either one then you define a third measure that uses a switch statement to basically pick which one am I going to show right that's yeah. pretty neat um, then a disconnected table uh, with uh, with pickers in it you know what I mean so it just the, this is definitely the right this is the right way this is the DAXy way to think about solving the problem and for anybody who's kind of new to it, uh, this is a really good illustration. So, thank you. Yeah, so it sounds like you're back, I, and you're sounding clear now. That's great. Yeah, I just changed out the headset, so sometimes the other one does. Ah, perfect. Up. So I, I'm hoping this one is a little bit clearer. Yep, you're loud and clear. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, and that's a great point you made as well. These are disconnected. So these these picker tables, the toggles, uh, those do not have a relationship to any other table in the model, and they have to maintain that kind of non-relationship stance for this to work. Um, if you connect them up, then it, it won't work anymore. <laughs> um, and so I can show you, if you're interested, how that looks. It's a little bit messy underneath the hood here, so I apologize. Um, but here we have the model. Um, and if you, if you go in here, you know, if we bring in just, so to, if you have a mess, if you have a model with lots of data in it, this is actually um, a little bit of a tip. You can bring in just one table, and then you can just add the related tables, um, and then you can actually, you know, like okay, well, I still didn't want to see everything here, so you can. Um, so the delete from diagram model, which you don't want to do, but you can just remove it from the diagram. So then you can just remove these from the diagram. So you just want to see. Um, if you just want to see what that date and fact looks like here. And so this is really cool because then you can make as many of these as you want. And now if I bring in those slicer tables, you can see that they're, they are not connected. Okay, so I'm going to move on from that one. Um, and now I want to talk about grouping of visuals in Power BI Desktop. Um, and I'm going to kind of join these back together a little later. Um, but grouping of visuals is pretty cool. I haven't used these much. I hadn't used bookmarks until recently, honestly, and I end up with um, a migration of a report. Um, and it had a lot of bookmarks, a lot of bookmarks. Um, and I was a little bit overwhelmed, to be honest. Um, and so one of the things I found was I could group the visuals and it made my life a lot easier. Um, so what I found the first is you have to go and set some stuff in the options to be able to group visuals. So this is where you go to do that. Um, I had I have I also have a link in this PowerPoint that uh, shows you the thread that where I found out how to do this because it was not obvious. And then, um, what's interesting about this, and I, I really wanted to call that out because I noticed a lot in especially the guy in the Q videos they're talking about how the process is of like kind of creating reports and solving problems. It's not like we just magically know everything. Um, learning how to kind of find an answer is really important and there's a lot of resources out there. Um, okay, so here is the, so I, the scenario for this one, I seem to have, that is, I seem to have lost my, that is it. Um, the scenario for this one is I have two pie charts and I want to flip them to show the charts and I want them to be independent of each other. 
And that's the key part. So I don't want it to affect the size of the top. I don't want them to affect over here. And so with grouping, it's easy to create a bookmark that will only work with a selected group of visuals and you can kind of keep track of it. So if I go to here um, in the PowerPoint again, um, you go to view, you open up that selection and bookmark panes here. Um, and then if you select all your visuals, so you just hold down control, select them, and you can right click and group them. Now I rename that to by product and I can show and hide visuals from this pane as well. So then you can hide the chart and the detail table for the bookmark to show the pie chart and um, all that stuff. So here is, so once I've added them, so once I've added them, when I click once on the group of visuals, you'll see there's a box around all of them. Um, and then it'll, you can click up here to select the whole group as well. You can add that bookmark with the view you want. Now, the one thing you have to do once you've created the bookmark is you have to unselect data. So that will make it so if you have a, so whatever the data is on, like if you have it filtered in some way, um, it'll keep that if you keep that check mark. And then by default, it's all visuals, but you can then change it to selected visuals only. And now it'll only affect the bookmark will only affect those four visuals. And then the end result, of course, is that they move independently of each other. Now I want to go ahead and show you a little bit what that looks like here. So here is, if you go to view, there's my bookmarks, and there's my selection pane. And so you see I have my group of the product and the group by industry. So if I click on this one, the select, it's actually selecting all four of those visuals. And I can uncheck things, I can look at them. But then if I go to here, it'll show me each of those views. What's cool about the bookmarks also is if you add or remove, if you add some visuals to this, it's easy to update those bookmarks once you've done it. Um, to only use again just that group and put them in the group. Um, the names here come from the titles in the visuals themselves. A lot of times if I'm doing a lot of visuals and I'm grouping them, I'll actually turn off the titles, like I'll hide the titles and I'll just name it something that I can identify here and then I'll put like a another card or something that will be a title for the whole entire group. Okay, so that is how to do that. Um, what's cool about this is actually, um, I was messing about on the Power BI community forums and someone had asked a question. They wanted a visual like this, um, that was a KPI donut, um, you know, and they wanted to create this in Power BI. And I thought that was a really interesting, interesting, interesting problem. Now this is, so I recreate, so I did it for them in the community forums. And I think I have, I have the link, I'll put the link in there as well. Um, but I wanted to walk through the process because it's actually quite neat and it has opens up a lot of possibilities. So basically any visual in Power BI can become a KPI visual using kind of this step. Now this is that grouping of the visuals. So we have, this is actually four distinct visuals. So you have three shapes, a card and a donut chart. And that's it, and I've grouped them together. Now once, also once they're grouped, um, I can copy and paste the whole group so I can make multiple of these and I can resize it and I'll resize all five visuals at once. Now I have to hold down shift to keep the aspect ratio or those circles and they don't look so good. Um, but it's actually really cool because this basically acts like kind of one visual. Um, and then that selection pane comes really important if we want to kind of change anything on an individual layer. So there's five different layers. It's kind of hard to click on. And I want to show what that looks like here. I'll go to my donut shape. And I have a pretty cool little gift background on this one, which I really like, but I was testing the Zoom video yesterday. It doesn't look quite as good on the Zoom video. So I'm just going to move over to this page without the background. Now this is some of the different variations I did with the exact same structure. But the idea here is I'm toggling between different measures as well. And that's just going to get that measure architecture um, to do this. And I want to show in, actually, I wanted to show you in Power BI desktop. 
I had them open earlier, but then my computer crashed. So sorry about that. I have to reopen it. Um, that functionality where you can kind of resize it, copy it, paste it, do whatever you want to it once it's already created. The other thing is, um, and I'll go into this. So this is just kind of the visual side of it. It's going to take a while to open. So I'm going to move on and I'll come back to that. Now the KPI part is a little bit more complicated. Um, so there are, in this scenario, so the person on the community forums had about 20 or so measures they had to kind of make this chart for. And so I was like, well, okay, you probably need a way, you don't want to have to recreate like a number of measures for each measure. So basically I made it so you have a number of measures. So I had five base measures just in my example, but they can be anything. They can be like a percentage target by region. They can be a different product, a different industry. Any way you want to create those measures. Mine are pretty basic, just for the example. Now that aggregates them into a single measure. And using that kind of toggle functionality I showed earlier with the net and grows, you can do the same thing to pick which measure you want to use. Now the third step for the KPI is we're going to create four additional measures based off of the, the selected measure for red, yellow, green, and this. And you can have as many colors as you want. Um, these are just the, the three basic ones I chose. Um, and then what this happens is they are going to, only one of these measures is going to hold the value. The rest of the, the other two are going to be blank. And then this is just going to be that white space, whatever the variance to target is. And then show you how this works. So this is just my base measure. I just have numbers just for the example. Um, now this is that again, that selected value on the switch, same as the toggle example I showed earlier. Um, but this one does default to blank if nothing is selected. It does not have a default value. Um, and then these are that KPI measure. So if that measure is less than 50, we'll show the measure in the red measure. Otherwise we'll show this as blank and so on. So between 50 and 80, and then for this example, the maximum is 90. Now you could further develop this example to have different targets per different measure, all that kind of stuff. All that can be done. I just put it in as a number right now. Now, what's cool about this is it's really easy to set up on any chart. So what you do is you add all those green, yellow, red, and the mist as values and then you can either have selected value as the axis without the toggle so you can see them all together and the bars will color based off of what you've chosen and the colors are just set with the data colors you don't have to worry about there are ways to do it like in a measure and then do conditional formatting and all that kind of stuff it's kind of hidden um, it's a little bit harder to manage but this one's really easy you just set the data colors and there are also additional things like you can have different tool tips based off of if it's red, green, or yellow, um, which I thought was kind of cool. I'll show you that in a minute. So with this one, um, so now we have them set up. And so what you can do, so then you can see, so now we can show it like this. You can show it like this. Now what's nifty nice about this is because they're different measures, I created a tool tip for each one. So we have a different gift for red, a different gift for yellow and a different gift for green. Then that will work on any charts. So this is pie chart, bar chart, these ones. So I didn't have to do any extra work once I did it once. I just literally copied it and changed the visual. And even if I toggle it, it will change here. Now if I go to the Power BI and if I go to here. I want to show you that resizing because it's kind of cool. So I clicked it once and then I can show you that's bookmarks, the selection. So there's my circle. I have them kind of named kind of boring. Um, so I can just copy it, create a new tab. I actually need to copy the toggle as well. If I go back and grab the toggle, Paste that in here. It'll ask me if I want to sync usually, but I guess it's not that big. Now with this, I can hold down shift and I can resize it. It maintains that aspect. 
I can copy and paste as many as I want. And it works just fine. Okay, so that's all about my donut KPI. Any questions? Okay, so the next one I have for you guys is I have um, created so so forecasting. Forecasting is kind of an interesting topic in Power BI. There are a lot of different ways to go about it. There are a number of visuals like our visuals and that stuff like that that will work through forecast. Now this is nothing, I'm not going to show you any of that. Um, what I did was just kind of a simple forecast and all this does is create a rolling 12 month average um, and extends it out another year. Um, the way that this is done, um, so that's just that same chart, um, is the first thing you need to do is I needed to extend the date table. So my date table I had with this data was only up till November 2014. And so I extended it out um, to 10, 2015. This is just the, the data that I had pulled um, from the Power BI data sets. And so the way I, I didn't want to recreate my date table and I actually didn't have to. Um, what I did for it is I created an extension that went further. This is my date extended. And then I just attached it to my date table. Now, typically I don't like this multiple steps, but it worked really well in this scenario. And if I look at this, this is my date table. Um, I have it all set up. And then, so this actually came with the data model. That's the other reason I didn't want to touch it. So usually I create the data date table when I'm creating my data model, but this one actually came from like, um, from the source. So if you're getting from a data warehouse, sometimes you'll get your date table and you'll be like, okay, I'm stuck with the dates that they give me. Um, whereas my date extended, then I could just create a calendar table with all the dates I wanted. And then I ex just attached it here. And now I can extend out my the existing date table. So once I did that, the DAX for it is not that comp, it's not too bad. It's not very long. It's a little bit complicated to have the average X's and you have your alls that kind of change the context of the filtering. Um, but what this does is just taking that 12 month average and pushing it out. Now this bottom row here, this co this police, I'm not sure if Russia has to say that properly. This one will take, if there's an actual value, so that sum of revenue that we built off of earlier, um, if there's an actual value, go ahead and use that. Otherwise, use the forecast. So you can kind of see the actuals and forecast in the same line. Um, now, that's actually important if you take this model one step forward. Um, like, say, if you were trying to model your expenses out, and then you had, say, forecasted volumes, and you wanted to multiply them by different prices, and then see how that worked with the forecasted uh, expenses, and see how that would play out. So that's one of the scenarios you can use this for. Now, the other scenario that um, I was playing around with is, so we're in a pandemic. Um, typically, the pandemic will either be very good or very bad for your business. So what I created in here was also a parameter that I can play with that will take that forecast line and then multiply it just within the last two months and then continue it out without that multiplier. So here is at 40%, 20% increase, or negative 20 increase. And so you can kind of just play with the slider and see how that will affect your forecast line as well. So you can have some mm, adjusters to your forecast as well. Um, okay, so that is actually all I had today. I wanted to talk about some sentiment analysis, but I didn't quite get there. Um, there was some other tips like uh, scrims and tabular editor. So one of the things I did want to talk about was tabular editor. Um, tabular editor is pretty cool. So a lot of times if I'm working with a very big data model in Power BI, every time I add a measure, I get the waiting for it saying so it's recalculating all the data. Um, so it can be kind of troublesome and annoying to deal with after a while. But tabular editor can actually connect to the Power BI desktop data model, and you can make changes there, and you can see, you can do, um, I feel, if I look at, 
my demo here, you'll see in my fact table, I have these little um, folders. And you can do that in the, the view over here um, as well in PyREI desktop. It's a little bit harder to manage. But if I open up tabulator, and this is those XMLA endpoints that they opened up, um, it works really well with Power BI Premium, but you can actually use it in Pro in just using the desktop. I've just started using it. Um, <laughs> I haven't quite fully figured out all the limitations of it, but here we can see I can select that model and open it up. And now I can see all that stuff right here. One thing I do not like about Tabular Editor is it does not have IntelliSense, like when you're using Power BI Desktop. One thing I do like about it is it has the DAX formatted built in. Now, when I've created these, um, so I can do DAX formatter, formats it up. Now I can save this and it goes back to Power BI Desktop. Now, maybe that's coming, I think I've seen scenarios where it shows up automatically. For me, it didn't. Um, what I have to do to see the changes is I save this and then I close it and reopen it. And now I can see the changes that Tabula Editor made. So it's not ideal in that case, and it probably will get more streamlined in the future, but it, it actually will work um, really well. So um, is there any questions? I'm not quite sure how to see if there are questions, Brent. Okay, here I am. Um, you, you know, I haven't seen any uh, just yet. I okay. think everyone's just been really happy with the, uh, to see that cool, cool way you built that donut visual out of uh, different composite pieces. And um, I saw how you used the new, like fairly new coalesce function, DAX yeah. function, right? To get kind of that, if this is null and do that, else if this is null, do that. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's pretty neat. Um, I was I was going to ask just one other thing about, uh, and I'm, I'm jumping around a bit, but um, uh, okay, yeah, there is a question that I'll circle around to here in just a second. But you did it like a GIF background, is that right? You had like an animated background for one of your pages. Yes. Yeah, so you can. So you can if you import an image into Power BI, um, it it won't move. Like if you just do import image, it won't move. But if you create it as a background or wallpaper of a page, it will absolutely move. And so it makes some pretty cool, um, so this one, especially if you have like, this page has not many stuff on it. Um, I use it like if I have like a refresh dates page or something like that, that has something that'll, it's really quite pretty to have it with mm -hmm. GIF. Um, and then also for the other scenario I did it for was just those you know kind of funny tool tips on the different scenarios. And all those are tool tip pages with the background set. And then they are associated to the individual measures. So yeah, just that is really neat. I mean, the, in this case, it's kind of funny, but you could, you could, I could see other applications for that that <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, could be really, could be really useful too. To like, you could make an animated, um, I don't know, just icons pop up in your tooltips that you know make just make it that much more engaging, like a three D model of a product or something like that, right? Absolutely. And another scenario I use it for a lot is to have, and this is actually something that in the last meeting, um, I believe, uh, was it um, Nathan had talked about? Um, mm -hmm. He had talked about he had that little up button up here and you just hovered over it and it showed all the definitions. And that's the same mm -hmm. scenario. So you just have a measure that says show or hide and they make it equal to one and then put it on like a tree map and then have that as a tooltip page. And so you can kind of have kind of hover over like fly out definitions come on. I've used that in a couple of my reports since I saw that. I thought it was a really neat solution. Um, and then I started using GIFs and that. Then everything kind of declined from there on my professionalism and my reports. Um, so it's actually it can make it quite fun. We did have one question from Dakota. He was asking if you've used DAC Studio and how oh, that comp Dac instead Studio. of Tabular Editor and how does how does DAC Studio compare to Tabular Editor? So DAX Studio is really cool because it's it's kind of like a querying tool. That's what I usually use it for um, when I'm working with my models. If I want to make like just a, if I want to kind of try out a measure, or if I want to just kind of look at a subset of data, if I want to share like in my data model, sometimes 
Um, it's one of my self-service kind of tips. If people wanted to see, oh, Zoe, you know, I, I really just want to grab, you know, you know, a few values from your report and I want to put it into my Power BI with other data. Um, you can use Zach Studio to um, kind of make that query and then I can send it and show them how to set it up in their Power BI. It's also great for looking at the different columns in each table, kind of getting a feel for what data is in there. It has really great um, information that way if you want to explore exploratoring in other data models. Um, and it also has, of course, the export for the Rotopack Analyzer. So you can kind of get a holistic view of your data model, which I think is fantastic. And especially for, and you can also use it, so in that you can, you can find the query to find all the measures and the definitions. Um, and then I use that a lot um, when I create like a data model. I'll put, I'll go, for pro, I'll go in and copy it out um, and then paste it back into the data model with the definitions of all the measures so people can see it from a user perspective, which usually you can't do. Um, and then for premium, you can just absolutely, you can definitely build a separate report that'll show you all the DAX expressions as well. So it, I think DAX Studio is, is my favorite tool. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, and I'm just getting into tabular editor um, just recently. So great question. Um, the other thing I actually really quickly wanted to mention was for today's call, I actually set up, um, so if you want to play around Power BI, say, and maybe your company doesn't have it yet, you want to look at it, you want to see what the publishing looks like. I actually set this up and there's a video that Guy in a Cube did that shows you how to do this. And I set it up. So what I did is I created an Azure Active Directory in, in Azure. It's free. Um, it doesn't actually have email, um, but I created one and I can log in as it into Power BI um, and I created this demo space. Um, and then what I did is I get a free trial for Pro for 60 days. Um, I actually set this up for another project, um, but it works really well. That's a good idea. So you can do, you can get a, for another free trial for kind of any new Azure Active Directory account you create. Exactly. Yeah, nice. Was there any other questions? Well, you gave us a lot. I know one question <laughs> um, is going to be maybe, I, I was already asked by, by uh, Salman, do you think you can share the slides uh, after the presentation? Okay, that's, I know you did last time too. So I'll, when, I, when I include these, I'll make sure to point to the last one too, because uh, yeah, these are definitely go back and review and, and, and learn, um, learn as uh, learn again, because it's going to, you know, that's really cool. I know people will be saying, oh, wait, how did she do that? <laughs> yeah, so really I, I, I definitely built these so that you could, you know, go ahead and, um, and I'll share the Power BI workbooks as well. So you can kind of go in there and look at them. Um, I already have, I think the, I have I also had a, a Git repository. I was starting to put up some some models, uh, so to share the Power BI models when I'm working with problems on like the community forums for Power BI Desktop, as well. And that's where I did that donut visual, um, and I could share those out there. I, I'm using all um, open data sets, so it's nothing nothing secret. Well, that that would be fantastic. We really ought to get a yeah. We ought to get a, a group uh, GitHub repository going. So I might just start by forking yours <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> That'd yeah, be really absolutely. cool. I mean, if if there if it is all public stuff, then that's okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay. Well, uh, well, thank you. And so I also just before since we have just about two extra minutes here, um, this is a good chance for me to say thank you to Blueprint uh, and. Um, and that uh, they, you know, they really give of Zoe's time, and they've been a really consistent sponsor of our Oklahoma Power BI user group for really for years now. And so, uh, you know, they're just a really one of those one of those dream sponsors that you're thankful for. That almost any time we've asked for, hey, could, would you mind buying us lunch? They say, yeah, sure. Hey, can we have some of Zoe's time? Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, uh, really uh, thankful, thankful for them. I'm going to.